Uh, Tom Lee is here. Tom Lee, you know and love. You've seen his uh, many appearances on CNBC. He was on uh, the Halftime Report with me today. And uh, Tom is the founder of Fundstrat. Tell us, give us like the um, elevator pitch on what Fundstrat is. Uh, Fundstrat is a research advisory firm. Okay. We have two kinds of clients, uh, hedge fund mutual funds. Yes. And that's Fundstrat. Yes. We also have like a family office, RIA, uh, individual high net worth research business called FS Insight. Okay. And that's more of a web based business. How different is it to get research to that audience versus like the hedge fund audience? Like what, what are you giving or not giving that separates that service out? Uh, the Fundstrat is a high touch service. So it's a, like a concierge level. We do a lot of bespoke work for people. Um, our research team is essentially an outsourced research arm. So right. people give us projects. The FS Insight is more of a push product. Um, because they're not coming to you for bespoke research, the the, uh, the family office, are they? That, well, if they are, then they if they need a higher level of service, they should be Fundstrat clients. Okay. Yeah. So FS Insight is more of a web only. Okay. Business. All right. So what are we trying to promote today? Let's promote the FS business because that's probably our audience would be most interested in that. Yes. Okay. So where do they where do they uh, where do they go if they're so dazzled by your appearance today? They go to fsinsight.com? Correct. Okay. And and they there's sub couple of tiers of services if they want crypto or not and got it. But they'll have access to our research team which is quite large now. It's I think 24 research people. Wow. Yeah. 24 is but we're trying to hire our first staffer for our research group right now. Um so we've got five people on our investment committee and we're trying to bring in somebody probably from this audience or from Animal spirits. All right. So Tom's here. Uh, Tom, we're going to start with what you thought was the biggest surprise of 2021. And by the way, not that you were very surprised by this year because you seem to have gotten this year mostly right from the outset, which we're going to get into in a second. But what would you say was the thing that was most surprising to you? Uh, I would say if I went to the highest level and was trying to look down at the market, I think the resilience of the stock market is the biggest surprise. But was it – where was your target in January? Uh, Might have been to like 4,600. Nailed it. And where are, where are we right as there. of today? 46. Yeah, right so that wasn't a surprise to you at all. You're like a wizard. You yeah. Nailed it. But, you know, that's a double – that's a 20%. Like I, we're of 20% kind of year. Okay. So was that like a stretch – was that like a stretch target for you or you felt, uh, you felt really good about it? Uh, so I was – I'm working on my 2022 outlook, so I'm – been looking at what we said in tw for 2021. No spoilers. And, no, we're all going to yeah. spoil that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it turns out that the base case is 24% year. Okay. Uh, because the biggest reason is it, that we expected volatility to collapse. And, th and that was the case for most of this year. We got two Correct. VIX spikes, but they were both kind of baby spikes. Yeah. So the VIX averaged in 2020 at over 27. Most which, of that was from Q1. Correct. It stayed that, elevated though. The whole didn't it, right. Yeah, it didn't drop. It's it was the third highest ever for delivered vol, and so in the two prior instances when vol drops, you were you had a twenty five percent average gain. Okay. So that was our base case this year. Okay. So so you were looking at it like, look, we know we're not done with COVID. We know we're not done with a lot of the 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 problems of reopening, but it's unlikely to have an average VIX as high as the one from twenty twenty. Correct. Yeah. So you'd have to really keep the level of anxiety high enough to keep an average VIX at 27. And, you know, this year we're probably averaging 16 or 18. And and that drop is a re-rating of the stock market. So volatility plays a big role in your forward-looking analysis. Uh, in, in certain moments. Like now yeah. where we are here for next year, volatility is not central to our thinking now to what how markets can perform. Okay. So how do you know when when to take that into account or not? Uh, it's like, it's a sort of a signal from noise okay. thing, which means it's same thing with like AAII sentiment. It doesn't mean anything until it gets to an extreme. One way or the other. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about sentiment a little bit later. What's your, what's your big surprise for this year? I've got a few, I don't want to hijack too much of this, but I'm, I'm surprised at how quickly everybody was right on the arc story. ARK had all of the attention in 2020 outside of the of COVID, like just on the stock market mm -hmm. side. 
uh, sucked all the oxygen out of the room. And I'm surprised at how quickly it gave a lot of it back and that everybody, all of the people that have been on Wall Street for more than two years were waiting for the young people to have their comeuppance and it happened so quickly. And so, and so obviously it's like indisputable at this point. Like what, what are the stats on ARK? How much is it down from its peak? A lot, 40, I think. And there are some individual stocks in there that are down like six, I mean, 60. So, so one other thing surprised me, uh, and maybe this shouldn't, but Carl Quintanilla tweeted this the other day, the percentage of total household assets and equities is like so far above what it's ever been. And I'm given sorry. where we came from last year, this, this, this is an interesting chart. And that's with housing prices way higher too. That's true. That's a good point. Which, so, which so for context, more for context, this peaked in 99 at around 21%. And I don't know exactly how this is measured, but we're bumping up against 25% indisputably. And this chart goes back a long time. Indisputably, uh, it's not, it's not bullish when stock, when households are this aggressive. I do think you could easily make the case that it's different this time. Well, yeah. And I, I would say that my only issue with charts like this is it's based on assuming you have to do a forced ranking, like a forced allocation. Um, like no, like what, do you, some, what do you mean by that? That means when you do percentage to 100, right? This is percentage in, in equities. Then households don't necessarily make a conscious asset allocation decision. Right. So equities can become a large percentage because they never sell. And they've gone up a lot. Yeah, but but they don't have to necessarily allocate more. A equities can just compound. Okay. And so, so if your equity is compounding faster than your net worth, it's going to actually rise. So this, what this is not showing is like flows, for example. This, yeah, this it, doesn't necessarily show people getting all bowled up. Yeah, so they're not necessarily forced to rebalance. Like nobody every year says my household net worth, I need to reallocate out of stock. Yeah, I'm going to trim some of my house and buy some more stocks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a good point. People don't write. People don't look at their, their household net worth, their to has household total assets, whatever this is showing. And say like I'm underweight stocks relative to where I want it to be. Yeah, I mean, relative to my it, primary mortgage, yeah. nobody says that. And then if you throw crypto in there, like then you're going to automatically say, well, crypto has already broken the right. tape, the scale because it's never been this high. Well, so the other thing is, the other thing is, isn't this just a concurrent indicator? It's like margin debt. Yeah, like like yeah, of course stocks are a higher percent, not because people got more bullish, but because they went up. The correct. Yeah. That's so exactly that's what Tom's right. saying. What's your biggest surprise? Do you have one? Uh. My biggest surprise is that we got through that Delta variant without having to like do the whole Great Depression conversation all over again. I really did not think we would be able to shake that off to the degree that we did. And none of the work from home stocks worked during Delta. Like they started to crash. When prior was Delta? To that. Was that spring? Was that July? Made July. July. It peaked like it peaked in September, but it started in July. Look, you're looking at the chart, you don't even see if it. You, like if you if you were like Everybody's selling off these work from home stocks. They're going to be wrong. COVID's about to make a comeback or a new wave. So that did happen. And those stocks just continue to get killed. Yeah. I, I think one difference is uh, with each variant, there's a, an expiration date. Like the Delta burned out. Yeah. And Omicron will burn out. I mean, and Delta did a lot of damage. More people died in 21 than 20 from yeah. the pandemic in America. And I'm not sure if that's true globally. I know that's true here. So it, yes, it burns out, but like, yeah, it, not yeah, before it, it, it takes burns. a lot of people with it. Yeah. Here's another chart I want to talk about. Throw this one up from Katie Greifeld. Uh, this is a quote from JP Morgan's Clinton Warren. We have clients calling in historically when the market pulled back 10% and then those clients calling to buy in at 5% and now it's 2%. Any 2% move or so clients are getting in. Just Who's, the, who's Katie uh, Greifeld? She works for Bloomberg. So just the relentless nature of clients waiting to buy the dip. It seems like, again, to this point, it was 10% will get in. Now it's fine. I mean, they are just, the, the the dip buyers are relentlessly showing up. That, that's that been surprising to me as well. Yeah. I mean, that's a 1990s uh, phenomenon because I was at Smith Barney in the 90s and Smith Barney is wirehouse plus institutional. And Quentin Stevens, who was head of equity capital markets, you know, we'd have like a weekly huddle and Every time the market was down a little bit, he'd just tell us how much money came in from retail. And yeah, Josh, a week, a week or two ago, we were like joking, like, is this it? Like, did the stock market just bottom? And the S&P was off 5%. The Nasdaq was off 7 Now, of course, a lot of the high flyers were down 70%. So 
And but 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 that was the bottom, and the market just made a new high. There's yesterday. two questions: Did the stock market bottom, or did Apple and Microsoft bottom? It's two entirely different questions. So, and and one of them has more of one of them has more importance to the S and P five hundred than the other. So we've had this phenomenon now, I think, for six months with deteriorating breadth. Yeah. Um, there is a rotation. There is a new group of stocks that have led in the last six months, but they're not that important or big. The only thing that really matters if you're talking about, quote unquote, the market is Apple and Microsoft for yeah, how much but, longer but, can that but, continue? But, and the giant financials, like that's a big piece of the market too. Those And those are working. What's the biggest financial? Berkshire, Berkshire. is 600 billion. Okay. Goldman is 150 billion. You're going to tell me JP, that matters? JP, JP, one day of Apple. JP Morgan, Berkshire, Bank of America, they do matter. Okay. Combined. They matter. Right. Fair. Uh, all right. So do you, do you think that people are, do you think that this is just a learned behavior, this automatic buying of the dip after 2% because it's worked for so long and people don't know anything else? I, I think that for the last 20 years, stocks were considered a sucker's game, yeah. right? Cause people invested in alternatives, bonds and thought great blue chip companies were just a sucker's game. Or whenever they went up, they were riskier. Yeah. Right. And that they'd crash any time. Um, but I think COVID showed the, the these companies aren't killable. They, we might be in a period where PEs go up a lot in the next decade. So, so, so that was, hey, how, here's another. Ju- that was kind of the thesis behind the Dow thirty six thousand book, which I think came out in ninety seven or ninety eight, where they basically said, no, it's not. It's not that. Uh, stocks can just become overvalued forever. It's that they've been undervalued for too long. And not that they were proven right or anything, <laughs> but, but that was that same idea, which is that we have systematically been pricing blue chip U.S. companies at too low of a multiple for the history of the stock market, given how much return we've gotten from them. And that was their big idea. Uh, is that is that like pie in the sky thinking? or? Uh, yeah. You know, like that's not a great timing thing because you never. I mean, he was right, but it took twenty years. Yeah, um, yeah but, he doesn't get a victory lap for that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> he 20, had two fifty percent crashes right after. If if someone's already having grandchildren before he's right, then it's it was right. too early. Um, but you know, after GFC, credit knowingly mispriced uh, instruments because I don't know if you you know CDS people don't follow it as closely as they used to, but if you took a company like Cisco. And the CDS was actually fairly tight after the GFC, but Cisco had no debt. So it was a net cash company. So technically, it could actually have no default on its debt. Yeah. But if you looked at the assumptions and how Goldman, Morgan Stanley, J. Morgan were pricing their CDS, Cisco, if you thought the recovery rate was 98% of a bond, and they have no bonds. Right then the probability of Cisco defaulting on its debt was Zero. over 50%. No, but it was priced as if it had a the 50%. Market, the CDS market was pricing as though that was a one and two shot. Correct. How? For, for how, persistently. How, how do smart people, the CDS market is professionals. Yep. How do smart people do that? So, uh, but this is, so I talked to our, when I was at J. Morgan, our, our desk about this. They're like, well, you have to remember, Tom, in the CDS world, you only have to worry about a contract if the company defaults. So your rules get broken. That's right. why you have to price it this way. But the point is Cisco was a net cash company. So it, in other words, if you believed the numbers, you should just be writing CDS all day. Right. Because you'd actually just scoop oh, up the at premium. that implied default Correct. rate. Yeah, in that situation, yeah. of course. But nobody was really on that side. You know, so C- 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 Cisco had pretty wide CDS relative to its actual – Fundamentals. So my my big surprise I wanted to just throw out quickly was the IPO market. Uh, 399 IPOs in 2021 raised a combined 142 and a half billion. Worth now a combined 90 billion. Well, we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, the busiest year by deal count since 2000. Even though a lot of those are SPACs, they're still deals. Yeah. Um, the biggest year for proceeds of all time. Wow. 27 of those deals were billion dollar plus. Um, the biggest one being Rivian. Which raised twelve billion, which is the largest since Alibaba what seven else, years ago. What else was big this year? I can't really remember that many. Uh, I think Coinbase, Robinhood. Uh, oh, those are twenty one. That's 20, right. These are twenty one vintage. Yeah. I mean, Rivian is so so enormous. But were you surprised at all by the strength in demand for new issues, or does that just go hand in hand with an up market? Is it just as simple as that? 
Uh, well, the the companies you described are actually in growth areas, so I think it would be appropriate that you know, like, there's going to be big deals because these are, like, you know, if you remember, like the Philip Morris, like the deals in the '90s, which is big conglomerations. Yeah, that's a different kind of capital raise than yes. growth companies. Right. I, I I don't know if the EV space is overcapitalized now, but there were a ton there. You know, crypto, I think, is still early. So I, I don't think you can overcapitalize crypto at the moment. Do you notice that the same people who were wringing their hands about too much private equity take privates? Like, they're taking all the stocks off the market. This is terrible. That's too many. Then you flip the switch, you get 400 IPOs in a year. And I don't know what last year was, probably 250 or 300. It's like, oh, no, there's too much deals. Well, Goldilocks, uh, when would you, how many deals would you like? What would be the optimal amount? I'm sure you hear a lot of that chat or get asked questions about that kind of thing. Yeah. I, uh, you know, so here's the thing. I, I am struggling with some of these high level math numbers because the numbers are just so big now, you know, like household net worth is 600% of GDP. Yeah. But it's not as if household net worth is overcapitalized. It's just, that's how rich Americans are. Yeah. That it's, it, that 600% GDP is so big, you could, you don't actually need capitalism Wait, anymore. Wait, household net worth. To GDP. So deduct mortgages, deduct credit card debt, just the assets themselves. Yeah. So if you took a, whatever. Let's net say, of. Yeah. So US economy is, let's say, 25 trillion. Okay. Household net worth is 143 trillion. How is that possible? Crypto. So that. Do it. <laughs> say it. Blockchain. Crypto is only 2 trillion of that. Okay. But, a bit, but that number is like a real, like that's hard. That's actual residual book value. What was that number in the 60s or the 80s or some It's time never that, been this high. Well, this I mean, is I don't know if this is exactly right. This is household and nonprofit organizations net worth divided by GDP. Is that sort of the chart you're talking about? Uh no, because if it's updated, it is all time high. I okay. I'll pull it up on my phone. So I can while, ask Mike. Yeah, while he's doing that, this surprised the hell out of me as well. The the S&P 500 was up 18% last year. Yeah. I think it was up 30% the year before that. Yeah. It's up twenty six percent this year. Does it f not 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 no, only it does it feel like that. not feel like that? Guess what? The equal weight version of the S and P is up the exact same amount. It's not just mega cap stocks. They're each up twenty six point four percent as of today. I would not have guessed that. That's that's a big twenty twenty one surprise. Twenty six percent. That's a raging raging bull market. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are very few years way better than this. Yeah. Right. Twenty nineteen was an amazing year. This this is coming pretty close. Yeah. So, so here, guys, this is um, household net worth to GDP starting in. This is 1980, but we actually have it from 1950. Uh, but you can see we're rich. It's an explosion. We're rich. Well, based, but not only are we rich, that basically almost never goes down. Where, when does it go down? The GFC. GFC probably dot com. Yeah, it did go down a couple times, but right. But you you don't you don't need capitalism anymore, right? What do you mean? Because now there's so much saver capital, you don't need an economy. Mm. You don't, we're, you self, don't, we're self sufficient. It's centrifugal force. There's enough capital around already. Yeah. We're, it's like oil. Imagine if you have, we have the reserves. We don't have to import oil anymore. What if you just had that? If you just had an endless? Yeah. I mean, the, so the US essentially could be a supplier of capital to the rest of the world now. Well, aren't we kind of already? Or Yeah. So this, this, is, this is why I think people should be quite optimistic because essentially, the capital that's accumulated now will f will be used to generate returns you, anywhere in the do world. Do you think most people feel that way? Or do most no. people feel that the capital that's around now, it's, it's a only bubble. a matter of time before it gets destroyed in a bubble? Wait, and before you answer that, I also want to ask to, to dovetail off that. How have you been so bullish for so long? Because you've been optimistic, and I've been watching you for a long, long time. And I know it's very difficult. In person, to, Michael's to, been following you. Yeah. I've been stalking you. No, we call it following these days. It's been very difficult <laughs> To, to stay optimistic, especially in public, right? You get a lot of shit for that. How have you stayed? How have you kept your eye on the ball? Uh, some of it's just, it's, a lot of it's our work because uh, there is, I think, like sort of larger structural factors at work that support the bull market. You know- um, You and I talked about demography yeah, it's, last it's, time yeah, we were on. That's right. That's a big one for you. Yeah, and uh, like uh, just a simple observation, like um, most major companies are founded by people in their 30s. Right, um, right. 20 or 30s, like whether it's Costco, Blackstone, Bloomberg. Is that true? Yes. Okay. I have a chart that shows the age of the founder. They're all in their 30s. Wow. But what I about the majority? most people expect that? What about things like valuations and, and peak profit margins and, and all the things that can go wrong? Like do those, 
I'm not saying that you're not worried, but how do you like remain oh, optimistic? Yeah. Sorry, but let me just finish because yeah. like, so if you have more people age 30, then you're going to have more innovation. Okay. And in fact, so we found that there's a relationship between the number of people age 30, 50 and the number of patents filed. Is this just an American uh, phenomenon or, or do you see this elsewhere? So the U.S. actually is one of the few developed countries with a demographic tailwind. Okay. Everyone else is going the other way. Like okay. Japan, China, Europe are going. Well, the most amount of people in this country at a, at a common age is what, 31 or, or P- yeah. S- yeah. something like that? All right, so we got them right where we want them. Yep. Okay. So that's so that's a so I I would say to me, from a if I was just relying on demographics, that means we have a bull market through twenty twenty nine or twenty. So, but there are other people that study demography that would look at this the same data that you look at, and they would say, the baby boomers are going to sell all their stocks and sell all their houses, and that's going to depress the economy. But you know that's bullshit. Well, we know now in hindsight that that's yes. not how things played out. But I, I guess my point is arguments from demography solely can almost be made – like you can almost tailor your argument using the same data yeah, you based can, on what you want to – It's a reality distortion field, right? It you is, can, right? Yeah. But can, um, can we have peak earnings for, for millennials without peak earnings for companies? Uh, or is that a non sequitur? Well, the in-between is really how companies allocate capital. And so that's – like if companies get too optimistic, then profit margins will collapse. But they're doing the op- – I know, I know what they're not they're, – not only they're not collapsing, they're – Yeah, they, because companies are actually overly cautious, so profit margins will keep expanding. What do you got, what do you got there? Okay, so this is the number of people aged 30 to 50. In Duncan, America. you have to get these charts from Tom later. Yeah, but do you <laughs> see the um, – Yes. Where are we now? Where, where the orange line is. So it's turned up. By what? the way, the Nader – see this Nader? 2008. Oh, wow. Interesting. That's very interesting. So we turned up when? Yeah. Five years ago? And by the way, the Nader here was 67. Um, yeah, so it turned positive 2016. Yeah, because these aren't people. These are consumers, right? Like, let's call, let's, let's call it what it is. This yeah. is a growing number of people who are in the household formation phase when you spend the most money. I guess what, yeah. peak and, earnings? And that's what pr- most productive in a way, right? Most so productive. peak earnings, peak spending, how is that not bullish for companies? Yeah. So personally, I don't think I'm at peak spending. I'm definitely at peak productivity. <laughs> like I'm just like I'm just putting it out there. I'll probably spend more in the next few years, uh, but I, I don't think I'll be any more productive than I was this year. Yeah. I, I can't can't imagine. But take it. a look at this. see. This is the same chart below, right? Yeah. See the chart above. Yes. That's rolling S and P returns. That's crazy how how nicely that lines up. Yeah. So if this plays out, S and P's nineteen thousand. Wait a minute. What, what would, we're we're would 65. 19, we're what would 19,000 S&P uh, co- correspond to on the Dow? Is that 80? Uh, That's a triple. Yeah, so 100. This, 100. Well, S&P is like five. So like 4,700. Yeah. So this is. Oh, wait, what did I say? What are you saying? Oh, this is, S&P well, it's going close, to 19,000. It's closer to quadruple. Yeah. And that's by the time the people who we just cited as being 30 now are like closer to 50. All right, f- f- Correct. But yeah. let's just okay. stipulate that you're right and that these are structural forces. How do we survive bear markets? Because they're obviously going to happen. And is our bear markets going to look more like they did in 2020 because there's going to be such a quick fiscal and monetary response? Or was that just a one-time shot in the arm? And of demand for stocks. And demand for stimulus. No, demand for stocks. I need more stocks no matter what. So when they're down 5%, that's like them being down 15% a generation ago. I'll just take them down Are multi-year five. bear markets a thing in the past? I know it's a ridiculous question, but what do you say to that? Oh, I, I think there is going to be a horrific bear market, but it may not be for a while. And does it have to last an average of 13 months, which I think is the historic peak to trough? Like, yeah. can it be three months and we say, okay, that was a horrible bear market? Yeah. Uh, when I was at JP Morgan, we wrote a report called the guide to bear markets. Yeah, I probably read it. Uh, every major bear market is actually a retracement of the bull market. So 127%. Every bear market's 127% of the bull market. Really? Yeah. So it could be that severe? Uh, well, in other words, if you ra- if you rallied 100 points, a bear market's 127 points. Down. Climb. Yeah, so you always, you you go you go below where you started and then you're right, 27%. Right, so that subsequent bull market is then 500% of the bear market. Correct. Yeah. So the, the historically, yeah. So that's, so that's why it works. Correct. Okay. But that that level of wipeout, that drawdown wipes everybody out. That's why. 
Okay. So we'll we'll have a bear market like that. Um, not till twenty twenty four though. Or twenty twenty nine. Yeah, maybe not till twenty twenty nine. Okay. So at the have, lows in twenty twenty, so we, we were time. we were back to late two thousand sixteen levels. Yeah. So that's a a huge retracement. Um. But uh, yeah. So I mean, I think we could have we'll, we'll we'll eventually have a huge bear market. So I want to get into your outlook for twenty two. So you don't see that on the horizon in the next twelve months. Which let's let's hope you're right. Um. And I know when it, when do you publish this? Uh. When is this? It's going to air tomorrow. Okay. So. You, when do you, when do you publish next week? On the twenty first. All right. Let's so let's hold let's hold off on that. Let's get into the sh let's get into the streets uh, outlook, and then you could tell everybody why they're wrong. Uh, okay. Our <laughs> our friend Sam Rowe is out with the usual suspects. I don't know how closely. Do you follow other strategists or not really? Uh, I mean, I'm. Uh, people ask me all the time what what I think of what someone else thinks. No, so I don't. I don't mean like what do you think of them personally or if they're. Oh, smart oh no, or no, not. no, no! I know. I'm saying. I, I people ask me about their forecast, but I don't actually get re people's research. So I know what people are saying, but I don't know their rationale. Not even Barry Redholtz's. I'm just kidding. So wait. So do you uh. So do you do that deliberately? Do you do you want to make sure that you don't get colored by other people's opinions and just keep that out of your purview? Uh, you know, the reason I don't do it is I don't want people giving my research away for free. So I don't want to read someone else's research without. I heard you have it. huge beef with Brian Belsky. Brian, oh, you mean yeah? In a dark alley, we we had we fought it out one oh, night no, at an not Irish pub. Not strategist wars. No. Um, all right, so Mike, what is this showing? What is this showing us? Uh about prior year returns versus next year returns. I think you threw this in the doc, I, right? I did not. No, I did not. Oh, was my, this me? Okay. My, my, my take on the strategist outlook is they're always kind of the same. Uh, and I'm surprised more people don't go bigger to one direction because stocks are almost never up or down a few percent. Yeah. And I'm kind of seeing a lot of that. Like the just eyeballing this, the biggest upside target that I saw was like 13% higher. Is that Yardini? Yeah, I mean, I can tell you what some of the S simple math I know that probably informs how we would think about next year. I think you're more likely to be up 20% than up between zero and 10. Yeah. So the more, the plurality of outcomes is a, is, is double digit. Um, like in other words, even if it averages seven, it's usually like, but most people that sit in this chair, the strategist chair predict eight to 10. Like if you predict 20 and we're down five, you look like an idiot. Even if your prediction was closer to a historical yeah. Outcome. Yeah. If you predict eight and you're down five, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah. So last year, I would, or at the start of this year, I would have told you the base case would be 20 because of the volatility collapse. But next year, the base case, if you do midterm math or returns after 20% year, it's actually like 11%. Okay. Does it matter that la that this year was a 20% plus year? Yes. So well, maybe it matters after an eighteen, after a thirty-one. Like we're just stacking monster years. Does it have to pause eventually? I mean, I guess nothing has to happen. But I mean, internally, as Josh was saying, it's already happened. I mean, a lot of stuff is true. peaked in February. That's true. So we, we right, you go back to the market of stocks argument versus the index. Well, JC we JC will say sent investor enthusiasm peaked in February. And he's probably right on that. So how do you disagree with, so how do you take it? Do you take issue with this from Michael Navison? Quote, uh, this via Sam Rowe, if weak returns one year begat strong returns in the next and vice versa, then you should see a string of dots somewhere on the chart that slopes down to the right. Do we have that? Yeah, we got it. So meaning we should go down next year? That, like the, this, so no, basically- so this, is, this is showing that- Total shareholder return- um, and then total shareholder return next of, over the next year. So it's just showing pretty much total randomness, more or less. Yeah, it's it's brownie in motion. There's nothing there. So how do you, how do you respond? Wait, to that? hold on. I think I see something. Yes, yeah, that's sure. <laughs> <laughs> Buy it. Um, I would say. Yeah. Well, let me finish. Wait, let me finish. Sense historically, there's been no discernible relationship between the returns during any two years as reflected by very low correlation. If there were anything to draw from this chart, it's the fact that most of the dots are clustered in the upper right quadrant. And most of the time- In other words, off. annual returns tend to be positive. But there's probably more context that we could put on here, Tom, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, a lot of context. I mean, I would put recession versus non-recession and business cycle. Okay. I would put midterm, and, and, like election cycles in here. Are you writing a lot about the midterm for your coming uh, outlook? Yes, to an extent. I think it's going to play a role. Okay. I think it's going to be absolute f***ing chaos. 
Correct. That's why in midterm years, the market doesn't do anything in the first half. Usually it's down. It shouldn't this year. I don't think anybody should be making bold bets, year-end bets in January because- Yeah, watch me. There's, <laughs> okay. Besides, besides you. <laughs> Uh, all right, but that does play a big role historically in the midterms. In, in what way, besides being back-end loaded, like what else does that do, tend to do to markets when you're in that year? Well, in this case, there's just so much at stake, right? There's the virus uh, policy response. There's infrastructure. There's taxes. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to matter to consumers and to the markets. And as you know, these days, markets, because of scraping and alternative data Markets now react to what consumers do. Yes. Like before, consumers could do one thing and the markets would do nothing. Now they do the same thing. Like, you know, you saw Omicron panic and consumers and the market wobbled. Also, so much of consumption is based on stock market wealth. Probably yeah. more. The wealth effect from stocks is almost rivaling the wealth effect from houses. Yeah. And I don't think that was the case five years ago even. Yeah. So I think that's a big change. Tom, based, do, you, based do, you, on what shown. do you spend time thinking about like value to growth rotation type stuff? Yeah. Josh and I were just talking about if you look at a chart of like Berkshire divided by ARC, like that, that's a chart. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. I haven't looked at it. That's it, interesting. It, it only looks cool if you're on the Berkshire side uh, this year. Um, how big of a role do you think buybacks will play going forward? So it looks like this year, uh, in the third quarter, we had $234 billion in buybacks, which topped the previous record quarter, which was Q4-18, $223 billion. And this chart is ridiculous. Yeah. Th th this chart so it's is a what, it's a trillion dollars for 2021 plus. This chart is what pisses people off a, a lot about our capitalism or, and how corporations allocate cash. In 2020, obviously, rightfully so, buybacks collapsed. Right, there was a lot of fiscal stimulus. The companies got a lot of money, <laughs> and then boom, right back at right it. back to work. All time highs. Like I, I am not a buybacks or evil type of person. Far from it. But I understand, like from from a person who doesn't really know how capital gets allocated, why this pisses people yeah. off. Well, you know, I don't think that these are accurate charts either. Oh, because I a very Shout large out Howard Silverblatt. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, man? Tom, no, Tom's because, starting beef. <laughs> no, because uh, I think eighty percent of the proceeds of buybacks is is then issued to employees. Yes, they were so, upsetting yeah. stock option uh, related. Yeah, so yeah, so it's actually, this is essentially a funding. It's actually it's compensation. It's, it's a measure of allocation to employees. But not everywhere. Like tech buybacks are probably a lot more offset by stock based compensation for employees than airlines. Let's God knows what they're doing with the airline <laughs> buyback. That shouldn't even that that shouldn't even exist in one sentence. Um, but when you see a buyback authorized by, I'm just making shit up, but Pfizer, do we think that's as much offset by employee compensation? I bet you it's more than you it's think. Um, yeah, it's actually so? a very okay. large- Because the, the, the C-levels, they get paid in stock, a lot yeah. of it. Yeah. And, and their compensation plans are based on price performance. Right. Um, so if you look at, sh like, share county S&P isn't shrinking. So you know that the buybacks are just used to fund- That's how you know. Issuance, yeah. Right. So- how how much of your thinking um, is driven by what you think of dividend and buyback policy for the forward year? Does that even enter into how you're coming uh, up with what you think stocks it, will do? It, it does. It's just the buyback is a weird math because people treat it as if it's taking supply out, but it's actually a transfer of the stock to the employees. Like, you know, JP Morgan, I think 25% of the sh shares are held by employees. Right. And it's it's principally through this mechanism. And then people also tend to think that pe that companies are buying back stock instead of paying their employees or instead of doing R and D. And neither of those are true. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, and R and yeah, so R and D is an is a necessary spend, and it's get it's it gets a poor treatment because it's expense, not capitalized. Um, but uh, R and D is is a chart that is just up and to the right only. Yeah, and for tech. Because that that's capex. Massive. That's that's capex for well, the tech dead. industry. they're dead. The minute they the, the minute they stop, they're dead in in that space. Yeah. So I, I would argue these days in every space. Yeah, it would. You know, we tried to see if there was a factor base like you buy companies with high R and D spend because well, they that, should be better like companies. Innovation weighted, uh, like a. You, you try to see if that was like a smart beta factor. Yeah, and you know, and it's because guys like Phil Fisher used to talk about it, like in his. In the 50s, like how yeah. he would find great companies that way. But this is Apple's R&D. It's just up and mm -hmm. to the right. $20 so billion. What's so amazing about Apple is that they can do it all. R&D, yep. buyback, dividend, yeah. CapEx, 
hiring, innovating. Like there's, it's it's this whole Swiss Army knife. Google same looks exactly yeah. the same. And, yeah, and remember how long people said Apple was a hardware company, give it hardware multiple. Can't now. innovate, and well, they were given a hardware multiple for so long. Yeah, but isn't it amazing? Yeah. And they were doing all these things, but people just kept saying it was a hard. Hardware. In 2012, you could buy Apple at 10 times trailing 12 months earnings net of cash. Yeah. You know those Google Insane. trends, like the Google searches? I bet like back out the cash would have coincided with Apple because that's all people were talking about. Back out the cash, Apple's cheap. Well, well now there's true. even more cash <laughs> and even bigger buybacks. Um, one, other, one other thing we're going to pivot to in the category of surprises, but maybe this isn't a surprise. Junk bonds. No defaults. Yeah. Basically yields like a, like a municipal bond used to yield. Let's up this chart, guys. This is a good one. How much longer can this go on for, Tom? This ha I, I'm not saying mean revert, but like literally zero. Like you can't have zero no, defaults in junk bonds for more than a year, especially if stimulus is. Well, if there's no end. recession, you can. Yeah, this is this is a really important market to watch because, as you know, uh, the fundamentals are doing one thing, but. The spreads are doing something else. So what can you explain that to, to the listeners, what you mean by that? No, next chart while Tom's talking. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if you – this is actually a very accurate chart because the fundamentals in high yield are actually quite strong. Like they're improving the EBITDA. I think if you look at the aggregate universe, the EBITDA is above 2019 levels. Okay. And so they're fundamentally healthier companies. But the price of the high yield bonds is not – nearly tracking what's happening with the fundamentals. So we'll, we'll, get that, we'll get that in one second. But you know what's amazing? Look at 20. Look what look what fiscal policy did. The spike in 2020 was nothing compared to, say, 2009 and after the dot-com bubble burst. So so you had uh, about, it looks like a 13 or 14 percent default rate in 2009 in, in junk bonds. And last year, it was just over 5 percent. So, John, let's hope the next the chart to what Tom's The difference about. maker is fiscal and, and monetary policy, basically. Yeah. Reacting faster. Correct. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this is a chart. What are we looking at here? Junk bonds are one of the most distorted parts of the market. Most negative real rates in the last 30 years. Yeah, negative real rates in junk bonds. Wh what is the buyer thinking? So there's two things. There's there's the negative real yields, which Tom could talk about, but also the spreads to treasuries. You're not getting paid for these. Yeah, uh, yeah. And there's a chart in here. Let's see if I can pull this up. So, you, so you're not, so, right. So you're taking way more risk, but you're not getting that commensurate additional return. What were we talking about? Based on where you are. What were we talking are? about Coinbase Correct. for their, for their tenure? What were we talking about? Was it 6%? Oh, I can't remember. Probably like 4%. It was Co like nothing. Coinbase priced some debt? Uh, this a yeah, couple months it ago. Looked like free, it looked, basically looked like free money. They priced it in US dollars, which is meta. Uh, they didn't price it in Bitcoin, but it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it looks like free money from, from, yeah. from the perspective of a company that is not really around that long to be able to sell debt at that level. Yeah. That's amazing. So I, um, wait, closer, closer to the mic or we're going to oh, lose sorry. you. Um, okay. I don't think I have this. Oh, I do have this. You dunk it. I'm like a pro. Yeah. See how I jumped all over that? Yeah. That <gasps> Good job. Low 4% range for 10 year for Coinbase. That was in September. Coinbase sold 1.5 billion in debt. Low 4%. 4% used to be like New York State. And I don't mean used to be 20 years ago, low like four, three years ago. Low 4%. So what is the buyer thing? Is the buyer just a, a blind asset people allocator are, that doesn't people, care? They're starved for yield. I don't think rates are going to rise because people are so starved for yield. What do you think, Tom? Uh, I mean, credit is mostly spread buyers. Fine. So people don't have absolute return bogeys. Okay. Um, like imagine if people didn't care what stock prices did, but they played only the dividend on relative yield. That's oh, right. oh, the earnings yield relative to the ten-year treasury. Let's yeah, say. that that's credit is mostly a spread market. People, have, okay, it, so they're not consciously making this decision and saying, "I, I know I'm getting a negative real yield." No, they're, it's it's they're comparing it to what's out there. So look at this. These are high yield spreads going back to 2012. We see the blowout in 2020, and they're on the floor again. 3.3 percent. Yeah, unbelievable. Do you think we could that could persist for three years, five years, if the environment stays the way it is in terms of liquidity? Yeah, I mean, here's some here's food for thought. So this chart is this real yield. Okay. From 1870. So when it's gray, positive real yield. When it's red, it's negative real yield. Okay. We're just about to go red, meaning even if the Fed tightens, CPI is probably going to run above the 10-year. Okay. 26% of all years since 1870 have had a negative real yield. On what? 
Uh, on a on, ten year bond. On a ten year bond. Which means it's much more common than you realize. So that's a, a since when eighteen seventy. So what is that? About fifteen percent of the time, real yields on a ten year are twenty six percent of the time. Twenty six percent of the time. I'm yeah, very, so another, I'm very one, good at math. Yeah. So one in four years. So I don't think most people know that. Are those periods of time? Cl- are those years clustered? Yeah. So they're epics. Uh, they they tend to be epochal. When um, was the last one of note? Nineteen forty two to fifty eight. Okay, that makes sense to me. We're 19, rebuilding the country yeah. coming out of World War II. 1917 to 1928. Okay. Same which thing. is the same thing. Fairly notable. 1906 to 1910. Okay. So in those periods of time, people that held 10-year bonds were actually losing money relative to what prevailing inflation was, but they probably also own stock. Those same investors yeah. probably also, also own stock. Those are all massive yeah. economic so, events. So then this is 10-year return, rolling return of the S&P. The red is during the periods of negative real rates. Right. The stock market has always gone parabolic. So have we had that already? Or is that something that could... All right, so it doesn't... This is why my brain's breaking. The market's up 26%. It doesn't feel parabolic at all, does it? Yeah, so this is this actually ties into the demographic thing. So like that okay. plus this negative real rates means the S&P could go to 20 So you 000. really do feel like the best could still be yet to come. Yeah. I would say that's the base case. I'm looking for reasons it wouldn't happen, like when you talk about profit margins. But as you know, companies are managing capital, so profit margins surprise, which means it's more fuel for it. <laughs>